as much as we may like to avoid it. We may, throughout our lives, may be pulled over or even get a police visit to our home. What are we supposed to do in these situations? Today, I am joined by attorney Andrew Flushi to talk about it. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. Hey everyone, welcome to Timeless. I hope that you all are having a great week. Just a reminder to hit the subscribe button down below. Also check out the news portion of the show, which is on the Julie Noted playlist on this YouTube channel. And you can follow me at Julie R. Hartman on Instagram and Twitter. I am honored today to welcome attorney Andrew Flushi to the show. He is a traffic and misdemeanor defense lawyer for Flushi and Fitzgerald. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Julie. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here to talk with you today. Oh, thank you. Well, you told me before the show that you handle offenses that most people will probably have in their lives. And that got me thinking about how true it is. As I said in the introduction, we may not you know, wish that it would happen to us. We may try to avoid it, but probably throughout our lives, all of us will be pulled over at some point. To start off, can you tell me about how common some of these cases that you deal with are? Is it true that many of us will probably be pulled over or, or am I over exaggerating? Now, I don't think that's an overstatement at all. Uh, we represent lots of people who, you know, have pulled, been pulled over multiple times, unfortunately. But then we also have plenty of people who've gone, you know, maybe 30 years of driving without a single ticket and without a single police interaction. And then one day they're just maybe not focused on their speed or not focused on the car in front of them. And they end up in a little fender bender or end up being pulled over. So I think it's very likely that most of us will have some kind of side of the road police interaction in our lives. How many DUIs do you deal with? And has the number increased or decreased or stayed the same throughout your, your time? Um, we deal with DUIs every day. I mean, somebody calling or somebody in court for a DUI. It's, I mean, it's what we do. Essentially, we focus a lot on DUI defense. I think the number has increased. I don't have hard statistics for this, but I was actually just talking with a judge friend of mine that I'm seeing, a, frankly, an increase in, sadly, like moms getting DUIs during the day. It's actually kind of concerning to see a pattern like that. Wow, that's really interesting. Unfortunately, that's not surprising. Perhaps it's been happening, especially in the wake of the lockdowns and the pandemic where we see people turning to drugs and alcohol increasingly. So yes. could you please tell us, let's say we are in a situation where we are pulled over and we may have had two or three glasses of wine at dinner. What are we supposed to do? What are we obligated, if anything, to tell police? Uh, well, that's the key question. You're never obligated to tell police anything about the offense. Um, every state is a little different before we get into some specifics, but I can say that most states, the only thing you're obligated to really do on the side of the road is to provide your license, registration, perhaps proof of insurance. And then beyond that, you're certainly not obligated to answer any other questions about how much have you had to drink, you know, anything like that. Uh, those questions are essentially incriminatory questions, and you always have the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Will the officer see you as more guilty if he or she asks you how much you've had to drink and then you say I evoke my or invoke my first or my fifth amendment right? Um, it, arguably, perhaps. <laughs> In the law, there's lots of maybes. Um, but essentially, if, if my recommendation is if you know that you had anything to drink, the best answer if you're asked how much have you had to drink is to say nothing. Simply say I plead the fifth or just don't even answer the question. You can just keep your mouth shut. Um, an officer may is already going to be suspicious, frankly, if they smell the odor of alcohol. They're already going to be suspecting, is this a DUI? If you don't give them other information to go further in their investigation, then likely they're going to cut you a speeding ticket and send you on your way. Wow. This is not something I knew. I, I always thought that you were obligated to answer those questions. Are you also obligated to take a breathalyzer or can you reject that? The, the breathalyzer is a very complicated question. 
Um, the reason is there's two different kinds of breathalyzers. So one is the roadside handheld preliminary breath test. I've got one here in my studio, but I don't have it handy, so I won't go reaching for it. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a little device with a little straw. The officer holds it in your face and says, blow it, you know, wrap your lips around this tube and blow in this straw. And that's on the side of the road. In most states, the vast majority of states, you're not obligated to blow into that handheld test. In Virginia, for one, it's completely voluntary. You can refuse. However, once you're arrested in every state, then you're required to blow into the official test at the police station. It's a big machine. It usually looks pretty old fashioned. It's got a big printer attached to it. So it's a giant thing in an office. That is what you have to do under what's called implied consent. So you're telling me that someone can be pulled over, they can appear to be quite drunk, but if they refuse to answer questions that the police asks and they refuse to take the breathalyzer, the police would have no grounds to arrest them? Well, your question there had one key other fact. You said they could appear to be quite drunk. So if the police can articulate probable cause mm -hmm. about why they believe this person is impaired anyway, then they could still be arrested. That's the key question. Do they have articulable probable cause? So can they say your speech is slurred, your eyes are glassy, you smell of alcohol, you were swerving while driving, things like that, that's probably enough to arrest you. But if all they have is a speeding stop, an odor of alcohol, and refusal to do any tests, that's really not a good arrest. You might get arrested anyway and have to argue about it at court, but it's really not a good arrest in my opinion. Okay, we're going to have to cut this part. Sorry, my producers had a question. <laughs> they were asking me in my ear, so I'll, I'll, I'll start. I was listening to your answer, though, and it, it was a good one. Sure. Um, okay, I'll just pick up for, with their question. So in addition to the breathalyzer, are you also not obligated to take those tests where you have to walk in a straight line or follow the, the flashing light? Correct. So in, in every state, at least that I'm aware of, as far as the law goes, those are all voluntary tests. I don't believe any state requires you to do any of the physical uh, or eye tests or alphabet tests, anything like that. Those are simply exercises the police have made up over the years to try to tell an, an impaired person from a non-impaired person. There's a few of them that have some scientific backing but you're certainly not required to take them. And I would suggest to always refuse those, frankly, mm -hmm. because they're very difficult uh, and you're nervous, right? So you're gonna likely make mistakes. Right. Okay, so that's pertaining to drunk driving. What about when you're pulled over for a speeding ticket or you blow through a stop sign? I imagine those are sort of more objective because they watched you commit that traffic offense, but is there anything that you can do in that situation? Anything you're obligated to tell police? Uh, you're just, well, so back to the obligations, right? Under the Fifth Amendment, you're never obligated to tell anything really other than your your identity, your name, your ID kind of thing when you're driving a motor vehicle. So you, you, most states do require that. But you're not obligated to answer questions about why were you speeding or did you see the light or not? You know, you, you're not obligated to talk. And frankly, if an officer is pushing you like that to, to answer questions, I would just say, officer, I'm not comfortable answering these questions. You know, you don't have to be rude. I always encourage people to be polite with the police because being rude is never going to help you. But answering questions like that is usually not going to help you either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about when police may show up to your home without a warrant? Are you allowed to let don't them in? Uh, well, so don't answer the door. <laughs> if the police show up to your house and you didn't call them and they don't say that they have a warrant, uh, I would not answer the door, frankly. If you've answered the door already, uh, it gets a little tricky, uh, but you can close the door, right? You don't have to allow the police into your home unless they have a warrant or there's exceptions to the warrant requirement, which get a little tricky. Like if they're uh, chasing an escape fugitive and they have reason to believe that that person's in your home, they may be able to come in anyway, but you should never just simply allow them in because now they have your permission and they don't need any justification. How would you know if they ha have a warrant or not if you aren't letting them in? In other words, you say, if, if you know they don't have a warrant, don't answer the door, but how would you know that? Uh, well, they should announce it. 
Um, every, this is again where states are different. Not every state has the same warrant procedure. You know, it's all based on the Fourth Amendment requirement that there be a warrant for searches. But every state has rules and laws about what that means and how the state's going to essentially apply that. Um, and so in Virginia now, we actually have a rule or a law that requires when the police are serving a warrant on your person or your home, they have to give a copy of the warrant to you or the homeowner before they begin their search. So they actually have to show you, yes, we do have a warrant. Uh, I don't know that every state has that same law, but certainly if the police are there and they come to the house, I wouldn't answer the door unless they announce they have a warrant. And then you might say, well, may I see a copy of it? You know, it's not a, not a bad question to ask them. What are Miranda rights? What, what does that list include? And is the police obligated to read those rights to you once you are arrested or do you have to ask? It's a great question. People always have a misunderstanding about Miranda. Uh, for example, in DUI cases, a lot of people will tell me, you know, when we have our initial phone call, oh, they didn't read me my rights. But unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it just simply doesn't matter. So your Miranda rights come from the Miranda versus Arizona case where essentially the court said that before you're interrogated while in police custody, the police have to warn you that you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to have an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, they'll appoint an attorney for you. But the key thing there is it's called a custodial interrogation. So you have to be in police custody and they have to be asking you questions for the Miranda warnings to apply. So in a lot of cases, they don't apply. Mm. Are there any other daily encounters with police that I might be missing that you would like to inform the audience? Have we covered uh, pull, pull over, being pulled over with a possible DUI, a traffic violation, police showing up to the home? Are there any others? Um, those are the main ones. I, I guess, you know, if you think about some other ones that might apply to, to people, it would be stuff like the TSA checkpoints at the airport, or I know people who live near borders have all sorts of issues, you know, when they crossing back and forth over the, the borders, as in like the U.S., uh, Mexico border, things like that. People have also, there's sort of like roaming border patrol checkpoints and searches around the borders. So there's, depending on where you live, there may be some other kind of common interactions. So let's go to the TSA one. That sort of piqued my interest. Yeah. Let's say the TSA suspends your bag or confiscates your bag. What rights do you have there? Unfortunately, not many. Um, when you enter the airport, you're giving up quite a few rights, essentially, to, for the privilege of flying on that, that airplane. And so you don't have many uh, rights. However, keep in mind, you always have the right to remain silent. So, you know, it may not help you if you have nothing to hide uh, because the TSA, frankly, may get more suspicious and it might just detain you longer and you might miss your flight. So it's a very tricky situation when you're going to the airport. Throughout this discussion, when we were talking about, you know, what to do when you're pulled over, also dealing with the, the TSA, I kept thinking about how we have to balance our rights, such as our Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, with also having respect for the difficult job that, that police have, which is to keep us all safe. I know that there are certain things that we may not be obligated legally to tell the police, but I can also imagine that if we are, of course, I mean, we shouldn't be driving drunk, but if we are driving drunk, it's probably in society's best interest to be honest about that and face the consequences. Well, so I would never encourage anyone to fight with the police or argue with the police, even on the side of the road. Um, certainly, I don't advocate that. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not anti-police. You know, I live in society just like everyone else. And if somebody was to uh, steal my property, I would want the police to come and investigate and try to catch the person who did that, right? Um, at the same time, the police do have a difficult job to do while enforcing traffic laws. They never know what's going to happen on a tra routine traffic stop. Could be the nicest person who signs the ticket and is frankly happy with the officer and thankful. It could be somebody who's about to open fire with a gun, and they don't know that. And so I think we all need to remember that they have a difficult and dangerous job. That also doesn't mean, though, that we need to confess right there on the side of the road, um, because you still may have to take responsibility even if you don't confess. Um, but I don't think we should just roll over uh, and give up our rights on the side of the road. But at the same time, it's a fine line because we certainly don't want to fight and, and be difficult. You can simply not talk, 
and let the police do what they have to do. If they tell you to step out, that you're under arrest, step out and get arrested. That's the way it works. And then call an attorney. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm thinking about instances that we've seen on the news about police brutality or alleged police brutality. And almost always as unpopular as it is to acknowledge or talk about, the person was resisting arrest. This was true of George Floyd. This was true mm-hmm. of the individual in Kenosha, Wisconsin. His name is escaping me, but this happened a few weeks, or I guess a few months after George Floyd's death. This happened in August of 2020. There was also an individual whose name is escaping me at a Wendy's parking lot who was pulled over uh, and then he ran away. R- Rayshard Brooks, mm-hmm. thank you, Sean. And he grabbed the officer's taser and, and tased the officer. Certainly there are gradations of resisting arrest, but the through line here is that each of those individuals did resist arrest. Agreed. And the the problem is, even if you disagree with the decision the officer's making in this moment, you can't physically resist him. Now there's some body of law that says maybe you could, um, but it's very difficult and it's just gonna end badly for you, for him, for everyone. It's frankly much better if even if you disagree with what he's trying to do with putting you into handcuffs and taking you to jail, submit. You don't have to agree with it, but you can physically submit and fight about it later in court. That's the way our society is designed and that's the way it needs to be. Mm -hmm. My producers have the name of the the individual and Jacob Blake, that was his name, yes, in Wisconsin. Just quickly, what is that body of law? It's probably opening a can of worms, but but what is the exception for for resisting physically well, a, an officer? Yeah, so you can't resist arrest, right? But you can resist an unlawful arrest. So if the officer has simply no justification, no probable cause to arrest you, and they're just going rogue and trying to arrest you for no reason, well, then you can use a proportional response to resist that, just like you could use proportional response in self-defense. Um, but for you as a layperson, a citizen, to determine is this arrest right now unlawful in the heat of the moment when you're about to have cuffs slapped on you, that's a very difficult decision to make. And frankly, it's a stupid one to try to make. You should simply follow the instructions, get arrested peacefully and calmly, and then you can argue about it being unlawful later. So finally, I want to ask you about this case that we've seen in New York City. A 24-year-old U.S. Marine, Daniel Penny, was on the New York City subway when he witnessed a homeless man, Jordan Neely, harassing women and children. In an effort to subdue Mr. Neely, he put him in a chokehold, which, as we know, tragically turned out to be fatal. Now Mr. Penny is being charged with second-degree murder. And it's been fascinating to see because it's reignited all of these discussions about race and treatment of individuals who may be harassing others or, or may be mentally un- or, um, unfit um, or mentally ill. But also some are arguing that Mr. Penny was trying to protect the fellow passengers on the subway. He didn't realize he was putting this man into a fatal chokehold. Based on what you know, it's what we all know, it's what we're, you know, the information we're getting from the media. Do you think it's fair for Mr. Penny to be charged with second degree manslaughter? I think it's a difficult question. Um, To me, when a, a human being essentially dies at the hands of another human being, I think we obviously have to be very diligent in investigating that situation and trying to see what really happened here. What was the intent, if there was any, I certainly don't think the, uh, that, that uh, Mr. Penny had any um, had any intent to, to kill, certainly not. He intended, I think, to try to um, maybe be a peacemaker in a way in that situation. Um, so I think it's a difficult question, frankly. Um, to me, what really strikes me about this case is a case, a similar situation or even worse situation that I talked about on my channel not recently, uh, not long ago about Alec Baldwin, who essentially killed someone with a gun in his own hand And yet he's remained free and doesn't face any charges currently. Um, Yet we have somebody who was essentially antagonizing other people. And, you know, we, it just doesn't make sense that we have seen sort of a double standard when we have two people dying. I do think somebody needs to investigate and decide are charges appropriate and maybe what level, maybe some kind of minor level of charge would be appropriate. I, I don't know. I wasn't there, obviously. 
That is a sobering but excellent parallel to draw. You're exactly right. It's, it's, a, it's a similar situation. Both were involuntary, but at least in the mm -hmm. case of Mr. Penny on the New York City subway, he was trying to protect other people from potential harm that the mentally ill homeless man was posing. That man was actually on a top 50 list that the New York City Police Department had of mentally ill homeless people who they wanted to keep an eye on. So in the case of Mr. Penny, he was trying to protect people and unintentionally killed someone. In the case of Alec Baldwin, he wasn't trying to protect anyone, but he unintentionally killed someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does seem to me, unfortunately, we seem to have a double standard in how laws are applied, um, and, and it's certainly not a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure that – it may be that some charges are appropriate, right, or it may be that some civil suit is appropriate, uh, even if criminal charges aren't appropriate, but I think it's a difficult situation to evaluate. Mm -hmm. Attorney Flushi, thank you so much for joining me today. How can people watch your content and reach you? Uh, the best way is to look us up on YouTube at youtube.com slash Andrew Flushi. Um, we have a channel there and we'd love for you to subscribe and check out what we have to offer. We try to teach people how to educate yourself about your rights and tell your friends as well. And most importantly, don't talk to the police. Yes. Fifth Amendment rights. You know, we're so, as you were saying a few minutes ago, that you always have your Fifth Amendment right. I was thinking about how we live in a society where we're constantly explaining things. It's unnatural to evoke your Fifth Amendment right, but you've reminded mm -hmm. us that sometimes that is the best course of action. Thank you so much again. This has been very informative. All right. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate you having me. Thank you for joining us today. And remember that each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shape who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely, and act with principle and determination. See you soon. Take care. <laughs>